what miracle were they looking for? They saw dangerous dimensions of God. But at the slightest opportunity, they bowed to bow. They committed adultery with Ashtaroth. I speak not by commandment, but I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence. What Paul is saying is, if you say you, you have the love of God, the proof that you have the love of God is in your commitment to love others. Are you with me? Yes, sir. The proof, the diligence, the commitment, the visible reality of your love is in the expression of that love in another human life. You know that one of the things you will find out as you navigate this physical realm is that people can be wicked. Even Christians can be wicked. Yes. You know that thing that we do? When you meet somebody, you say, how are you doing? You know many people don't want to know what the answer is. Huh? You don't know? How are you doing has been reduced to a greeting. It's not really a sincere question from somebody's heart. Try it now. How are you doing? Then the person is going to next. How far? How are you there? He's going to next person. He's not really waiting to hear your answer. Because in the average human mind, he doesn't really want to hear the answer. He doesn't. It's just a way of just passing through life. It's not as if we are asking that question sincerely to say, tell me how you are doing. People can betray people. People can sell people into slavery. How do you explain that a woman gave birth to a young man and he can even sit with a witch doctor to negotiate his mother as a sacrifice for material wealth? A pastor, eh? organized, I went to rent hotel room. I'm telling you life story. Oh. Police, police. They put rope on his neck like this. They caught him. A pastor of a church. Organized with somebody. Went to rent hotel room. Then the person helped to send messages to his church members that they have kidnapped your pastor. Meanwhile, the guy was in the hotel room lounging. Members began to run helter skelter. Our beloved pastor. Our beloved pastor. They were trying to, they raised, I think, maybe 800,000 or so and called the, the so called kidnapper and said, This is all we have. He said, If you don't make it, two million. Pastor. Meanwhile, he was in a hotel room, sipping tea, having fun. The members could not sleep in the night that their pastor was kidnapped. Meanwhile, he was in. The, you know why? He thinks Jesus died to make him rich. So if he does not have money, it looks as if he's failing. Because if Jesus died to make him rich, then it is his birthright to live in affluence and billions. So if he's not living in affluence and billions, then the blood of Jesus is wasting. So the average Christian will do anything for money. That's why some people in church tonight are, are waiting for 31st where they will repent before the Lord. You know people are afraid of 31st night. Some people think they will die in their sleep. Eh? So they are waiting for 31st night. They now say, Lord, oh, sorry, I stole in the office. I did this, I did this. Then they'll be looking at it. It's happy new year. They say, thank God. They start seeing messages. Thank God you made it. Made what? Made what? Made what? Thank God you made it. You were expecting to die. Made what? It's because of the way we think. Many people, I've seen it happen many times. When I was offshore, we were on a land rig, land rig. 31st night, prostitutes everywhere, we run into the chapel. 
They are just waiting for 12 a.m. Then when they say, Happy New Year! From the chapel, they are already cutting eye for some brothers. There was one who was married. I have held his hands and we have prayed together. As I said, Happy New Year, he, he started looking for a damn cell to celebrate the New Year with. From the Happy New Year service. But the Christian thinks that one of the ways you measure your life is that you must be comfortable in this realm. It's not in the Bible. Next verse. Nine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, eh, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. What is this place teaching? Remember, what, are, what is this place teaching? So Paul now has showed them sacrificial giving of the Macedonian church. He now says, our primary example is who? So the question you need to ask yourself is, how was Jesus rich? When he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, how was Jesus rich? I'm not asking you, I'm just, it's rhetor rhetorical. I taught you during, through, during morning parables that if you wanted to count rich men in Jesus' day, Jesus will not be among them. So how was it? Because listen, he says, for you know the grace. That is the entry point to this scripture. The grace. That same grace that the Macedonian church is, is displaying is the same grace that Jesus displayed. And what is that grace? It's sacrificial giving. It's about sacrifice. He was rich. Yet, for your sakes, he became poor so that you might be rich. So the definition is, is this talking about material riches? Because how was Jesus rich? Those are the questions you should ask as a Bible student. How was Jesus rich? How did he become poor? Is that not the question to ask? How was Jesus rich? How did he become poor? And then, what did his poverty do to me? And how did I become rich? I don't have the time. Because this is not my teaching for tonight. But, you see, by the time you read this place further and read about the life of Paul, the person who is writing this thing, he did not die a rich man. Eh? So he could not have been talking about material prosperity. So how was Jesus rich? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 2. Okay, go to verse 5. Verse 5. Quickly now. Let this mind be in you, which was also where? So who are we talking about here? Come on, somebody say Jesus. Jesus. If you love Jesus, say Jesus. Jesus. Next verse, verse 6. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, verse 7, but made himself what? Taking the form of, the, of a bond servant and coming how? Verse 8. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death. Go back to verse 6. Give me NLT. Go back to verse 6. Give me NLT. Who being, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Verse 7. Instead, he did what? 
his divine privileges, he took the humble position of a slave and was born as what? When he appeared how? Verse 8. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died what? The poverty that the Bible is speaking about is Jesus' descent, willful descent from divinity into humanity. He emptied himself of his reputation. Emptied himself of his position and became man and died the death of a criminal. That was Jesus' sacrifice. He gave himself to man so that man can give themselves to God. So he became poor. The son of God became the son of man so that sons of men can become what? Come on, celebrate Jesus. So when the Bible says, he was made poor, it's not talking about your bank account in Zenith. He's saying that he was reduced to a mortal willfully so that you can stand in the riches of his grace. What is the wealth that he's talking about? He's talking about justification by faith. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about redemption. He's talking about you becoming the righteousness of God. Where? Christ Jesus. Bro, you are rich. My brother laughed. You are not rich in Naira and Kobo. You are rich in the supernatural blessings of heaven. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who had blessed us with what? All spirit. My God, I feel an anointing now. All spiritual blessings. Then he begins to list those spiritual blessings. He speaks about predestination. He speaks about redemption. He speaks about the forgiveness of sins. I may not have money in my bank account, but if I was considered worthy enough, the Bible says God who is rich in mercy. If God considered me worthy enough to spend mercy on me like hard currency, that Jesus took my criminal place and gave me his righteous place, then I'm important. Leave me with my one shoe. It's only a matter of time. If it pleases the Lord according to his purpose and plan, and he gives me two more, glory to his name. But whether I am rich in material things or I am poor in material things, the most important thing to me is that there is one who considered me worthy enough to die for me. I am rich towards God. Let it not be that you are worried about marriage, worried about a job, worried about a car. And yet when God looks at you, he says, you think that you are rich and you have need of nothing. But you do not know that you are naked. That you are blind. And you are destitute. Because when God measures men, he doesn't weigh them on the basis of material blessings. He doesn't. Many Christians are under pressure because they are quoting scriptures that are not true. Do I have a problem with being rich? No. The budget for the crusade is 11 point something million. If we don't have money, how do we do it? I've been announcing for crusade for since, since how many months now? We've not reached the target. If one of you was a billionaire, you would say, Pastor, don't sweat again. I will pay. There's nothing wrong with having money. But you see, bro, if all we can define your life by is material prosperity, prosperity you are beggarly. There's nothing attractive about your life. In the realm of the spirit, the way men are weighed 
the way men are measured is the amount of the presence of God you've been able to trap. How much of Christ-likeness has been formed in your life? Eee! I don't know, the burden came upon me in this, in Calabar, in, in Abuja. And I began to tell them, you know, we are raising a generation now that is obsessed with the supernatural. Obsessed with manifestation. The man they see, he they see, he not they see. That's why people are suffering. You know one sister, she found out with her own eyes that men are wicked. You know there's something in Christendom now called spiritual work. Huh? Hmm? What did I call it? Some of these false prophets, they are, they are growing fat hmm? because of the laziness and the foolishness of the average believer. So people are paying people to pray for them. Yes, I'm sorry for you. Your, your life, eh? It will be like rotting banana. You see? You, rotting, rotting banana, you can't manage it. Have you tried to eat rotting banana before? You will peel it like this, and you'll be looking for the side you want to bite. Everywhere is rot, is rotting. Rotting banana. Rotting banana. Because you are hungry, you don't want to throw it away. You say, let me manage it. You peel it like this. You turn the banana and turn it. You'll be hissing. They'll be wondering why the guy the verse is the banana is rotting. Rotting banana. A sister paid the guy. The guy said, I see demons in your family. Curses want to finish your destiny. Say, but don't worry. I will pray for you. Drop so small amount. Buy me ojile milk. You know, they, they don't like small milk. <laughs> Big tin of milk. Big tin of milo. Enough conflicts. Then some cash for transport for the spirits that will do the work. Huh? So the man said, I will do spiritual work for you. Go and sleep. So she was snoring at home. So she came to his house unannounced because he said he wants to be using those things to break his fast. So she came to his house unannounced. Or God was swallowing. <laughs> Meanwhile, she was dozing. Her destiny had gone from frying pan to fire. Spiritual work. So many are willing to make extra sacrifices because my generation is in love with the supernatural. We like manifestations. The average Christian does not want to labor. He wants a preacher to come and say, oh my God, as I came to this service while I was on the flight coming from Abuja, I just looked through the window and I saw God with a bag like a Father Christmas. And I saw goodies inside. I saw your package there. If it's you I'm talking to, say amen. <laughs> they want to be lied to. They want to be told fake stories. They don't want to retreat with the Lord and fast and pray. They love manifestations. In the book of Luke chapter 10, the Bible says that he began to tell his disciples. He says that the harvest is ripe. But the only problem is that the Lord does not have laborers. He said, pray the Lord, the God of the harvest, that he will send laborers into the field. Then he said, when he had finished talking to them, he now called the 70 and then gave them authority over unclean spirits, over devils, and sent them to go and preach the message of the kingdom. Then they went. When they came back in verse 11 or verse 12 now, of verse 17 or thereabout, they came back with testimonies. They said, Master, even demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, Oh God, that thing you were seeing on the field, I was viewing it here. I saw Satan fall like lightning. He said, But do not rejoice that you commanded spirits. He said, Rejoice rather that what? Your names are written. Don't be obsessed with the supernatural because even demons can work miracles. Native doctors can do signs. 
but only overcomers can find their names written in the book of life. If your name is still in that book and December 31st comes, and yet it looks as if God has not answered your prayer, rejoice that your name is written. Give him glory. Ah, the Bible says, for to him that is joined to the living, there is hope. He that is still breathing, whenever you wake up in the morning and there is still breath in your nostrils, there is hope. Somebody will say, but man of God, hope deferred, make the heart sick. When the heart sick, is sick, you turn your face again to the one whom your heart loves.